Next, from Belleville, we go one-on-one -on -one with Judge Steve McGlynn, who's running for election to the 5th District Court of Appeals. We talk with him about his judicial philosophy and his career in the law. This runs about 25 minutes. Judge Steve McGlynn, thanks for joining us on the Illinois Channel. Great to be back. We, uh, it's always a little dicey, I was talking to you off camera, when you interview a judicial candidate because you can't ask certain questions as we would of any other candidate, maybe running for the legislature or mm -hmm. some other position. Uh, but on the other hand, too, I think often voters find it difficult to understand what it is uh, that they should vote for or against a judge. So we appreciate, again, you taking the time to explain uh, your, your positions. Let's just start off. You're, you're running for the uh, uh, appellate court level, the 5th District. Correct. Correct. Uh, what, what are the issues that uh, you think are the most important in this race? The, the appellate court is the southern, the 5th District is the southern 37 counties of Illinois. I've previously served as an appellate court judge and I serve as a trial judge. What I think people are wondering is um, what is happening with the country? There seems to be a, a lack of concern or a lack of, of, of commitment to the Constitution. People concerned that government is getting too big, that it's over-regulating, and that a lot of things that we take for granted, uh, simple things, simple freedoms, simple liberties, seem to be more and more uh, in jeopardy. An example is, you know, people ask me, how does a mayor of New York get to tell people you can't drink a soda that's larger than 16 ounces? And that's a good question. Uh, we, so I think that, that one of the important things is uh, the rule of law. Uh, are, we, are we committed to our Constitution? Uh, we committed to our Illinois Constitution, or is that just kind of a snapshot in time and that the courts aren't as tethered uh, to the Constitution as one would think? Uh, I myself take an oath, uh, I've taken oath to the Constitution. I think judges need to honor and respect the Constitution, and they, under, they have to understand that uh, we're at a time uh, we are over litigated and we're over regulated. And the judges have a sworn duty uh, to tell government that if they're overstepping their boundaries, if they're exceeding the powers uh, that they have under the Constitution. It's the judges that have to rein them in and say you don't have the power to do that. So I get a lot of questions about that. I certainly get a lot of questions about experience. Uh, I, I'm a trial judge, have been an appellate judge. My opponent uh, has never served as a judge. But people want to know what kind of cases you've handled and uh, civil cases, criminal cases. So I get a lot of questions about that. We, we often say when we talk about some of the points you just made in the judiciary, are you a strict constructionist, you go by the letter of the law, uh, or are you one that thinks you have to uh, interpret uh, the law? Uh, now, those who would argue that interpretation is the way to go, and I think you would put yourself in the base one, you just said it, more the strict constructionist government. The legislature writes the laws, it's for the judges to uh, apply the law as it's written in whatever case comes Kind of a, a plain, I think the best way to understand strict constructionist is you look at the Constitution, you recognize that uh, it's the supreme law of the land, and you look at the plain language of the Constitution. Uh, it means what it says. Uh, it's not a particularly ambiguous document. You don't have parts of it where you look at it and you think, well, what the heck does that mean? So uh, what you want to do is you want to, uh, one, you want to uh, look at the language, the clear language of the Constitution, and run with it uh, and, and en enforce it that way. When you get into statutory construction, it's a little bit different. Uh, I have to tell you, as a judge, we get a lot of statutes that you read them and you think, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense, or or, or it contradicts it contradicts other statutes, and so then you're in a position where you are trying to understand what was it, what was the legislative, the legislature and the executive branch to accomplish with this particular piece of legislation, what were they trying to accomplish with this other piece of uh, legislation, and can they be can they be read? In harmony, is there a way that you can you can make sense of both of them? Sometimes you have conflicting things, but when it comes to the rule of law and constitutional interpretation, uh, you know, I 
I look at the plain language of the, of the uh, Constitution and enforce it. Judges need to be humble. Judges have a tremendous amount of power. And, you know, when I first got on the bench, I thought the most important trait for a judge is to be smart and studious. I now think it's to be humble. There's a lot of power the judiciary has, and you have a lot of special interest groups, a lot of lawyers, uh, people coming to you and wanting you to exercise the power of the courts uh, to advance their particular goal or aim. Judges have to be humble. They have to recognize that there's limits on our power too. And uh, we should be reticent exercising judicial powers, particularly when we're going in areas that the legislature hasn't gone or we're going beyond things that the legislature uh, has, uh, uh, has has uh, put in statutes or what the Supreme Court has told us with wanna, regard to precedent. Remind people just on the layering of the courts, we had the circuit court level and you're a trial court, level, right? You're a circuit court judge. That's correct. Then we have the appellate court and that's what you are seeking election to, correct. you and your opponent. Um, in the fifth, you're, you're in the 20th circuit, you're going to the fifth appellate court if you would be elected. Correct. Beyond that, it's the Supreme Court. It's the Supreme Court. Uh, you don't have, there's only very few cases you have an automatic right to appeal to the Supreme Court. In any case you have, civil or criminal, uh, cases that come up through administrative law, you have, you have an absolute right to an appeal. If you don't agree with what the judge or jury has done or the administrative law judge, you have a right to appeal. It comes to us in the Fifth District. So that changes. Uh, if that's, we're given the chance there to correct any mistakes that are made in lower courts. In the we, application of the law, and the, if the judge maybe by the appellate court level thought the judge at the circuit level misapplied the law. Correct. And, and the other thing is, the other, the, the other thing is too, is that, that, you know, there's a lot of new cases, cases of first impression. When the appellate court gets them, makes a determination, makes a decision, we publish our decisions, all the circuit judges and associate circuit judges in that district have to file the law as we have, uh, as we've announced it in our, uh, our decisions. That's why the, the appellate court can have uh, a very important impact, good or bad. If we get it right, uh, we, we help the judges throughout the district get it right. If we get it wrong, then we're almost forcing judges uh, to do to make mistakes or get it, to get it wrong. The, one of the questions I would have is why are you seeking election to the, you're already a judge, you're at the circuit level, at the circuit level you're going to have, uh, I'm, I might say it might be more interesting to at least watch you have uh, I love trial, that. prosecutors, the defense, I mean you're going to have that at the appellate court, but you have the, the witnesses, the, the accused, uh, and by the way, do you tend to deal, you, you're dealing, I presume, with both civil and criminal cases, are you not? I have very little criminal in my, the doc that I have. I'm the head of the major civil non-jury division. I do handle the petitions for sexually violent uh, persons and sexually uh, uh, dangerous persons, and that's kind of a quasi-criminal matter. Uh, we had some today that we, we worked on. But uh, I love being a a trial judge, because you're dealing uh, with people, uh, and I get, I have a lot of people who are representing themselves. They're nervous about the system. Uh, they think that maybe since they're not a lawyer, that maybe uh, they're going to be taken advantage of. And uh, so I like having the ability to talk to them about their case uh, and listen to them and help them recognize that um, that they are going to be treated fair, even if they're not a lawyer. There's no magic words in my courtroom. Uh, tell us what, tell us what you want. The reason I decided my term is up as a circuit judge, uh, so I was going to have to run for election either as a circuit judge again or go back to the appellate court. I think Illinois, the next two years in Illinois, are going to be two of the toughest years the state's uh, faced. We've got serious financial problems. Uh, the the state has serious financial problems. Uh, they've got a lot of bills they're not able to cover. They're certainly not paying them on a timely basis. There's, there's concerns about uh, the, the state for years underfunding the pensions. What's going to happen with that? Uh, I was the chairman of the Board of Catholic Social Services, and I saw our governor 
uh, uh, I think, infringe upon the constitutional rights of religious organizations by trying to dictate to them uh, what they could do. The appellate court is an area where um, we have a chance to deal with these, these uh, significant issues to try to get it right and to try to help others recognize what's the right path uh, to go down. So I think that uh, based from my experience in the circuit court, I'm in a, an excellent position to help the state uh, navigate through some of these very uh, trying problems. We're, we're seeing municipalities and local school districts having tremendous financial problems. That's going to end up in the court. It's, think of Obamacare. It goes through the Congress, the president signs it, but who gets the last word? The courts. And for a lot of the things that we're going to see in the next few years, a lot of the challenges that the state is going to have to face, the courts are going to, are going to play an important role. And I want to make sure that uh, the court has on it, judges like me that, um, that respect the rule of law, uh, have no problem being faithful to the Constitution, because I think a lot of the things that we're seeing, there's a conflict between the rule of law and what's politically expedient. And I want to make sure that uh, in this state, uh, the people's rights are protected and that they're not um, violated because there's politically expedient reasons to do so. When you are running for a judge uh, and you go out to various functions and you meet with the voters, uh, what, what is it you're hearing from the voters? And let me ask a second question and maybe you can wrap into that answer. Should judges be running for election? Uh, or I'll start with your second one first. A, have a, like the Missouri where maybe you're appointed to a position? I've been merit selected twice. Uh, the Supreme Court had a bipartisan Blue Ribbon Committee that looked at lawyers and judges, looked at their background, uh, personal background checks, a review of their, their judicial history, their, their history as lawyers. And uh, twice the Supreme Court, uh, after looking at a lot of lawyers and a lot of judges, appointed me first to serve Southern Illinois as an appellate judge, and then also to serve Southern Illinois as a trial judge. Uh, the Bar Association did an evaluation of me and found me to be highly qualified. Uh, I think that the problem with, with elections is a lot of the questions that people want to ask you, uh, it's, you can't give them an answer. And you can't say, well, here's how I'm going to rule on any death penalty case that comes before me. Uh, you could say that generally you support the death penalty. The U.S. Supreme Court, I mean, the U.S. Constitution clearly uh, provides for it. Illinois, we don't have it. You have, to, you have to follow the laws in Illinois as we find them. But uh, I think that it's good, the retention method is good, where the, um, the voters have a chance to take a look at the judge. After the judge has been on the bench for a number of years, uh, they have a record. It's good for the voters to be able to say, we want to keep this judge or we want to get rid of him. One of the problems we have in Illinois is that when you have partisan election, partisan election of judges, you have and special... You're running as I'm running as a Republican. Your opponent, obviously, Democrat. Right. I'm conservative, proud to be running as a Republican. But the, uh, I really worry about the money that comes in on judicial races, the special interest that comes in. I'm independent, but I'm not independently wealthy. And so uh, running in a district that's over 17,000 square miles. It takes a lot of money to do that. Now, uh, fortunately, I've got support from a, a broad base of support from people throughout uh, the district, uh, small businessmen, doctors, lawyers, uh, retired people, nurses, farmers, but it takes a lot. And, you know, when I ran in 2006, that was the most expensive trial court race in the history of the United States. And my opponent was financed by less than 10 lawyers and principally and they all had they all came to the court uh, representing the same class of, of litigants and uh, you know you you worry about how that influences who ultimately gets on the bench and once they're on the bench um, can they be independent can they be independent and in Is Illinois that a legitimate concern 
I think it's a legitimate concern. And uh, I've fought corruption in, in, uh, in my county, St. Clair, and state for 25 years. And I think it's a legitimate concern. Did you ever, as a uh, trial lawyer, when you went before uh, a partic particular judge or judges, did you sometimes question whether they were going to be independent or whether they uh, had undue influence from maybe their election? I think that one of the problems that the Metro East has, and one of the reasons that I'm running for the appellate court, I want to help them get out from under a reputation of being uh, a system that's too friendly to one particular side. And um, people know my background, they know that I'm fair, they know that I'm independent, um, that I'm not political on the bench. And that, I think, will help us get out of this, uh, get away from a reputation of being a litigation paradise. Because that has cost us jobs. It's cost us doctors. There's doctors who have left the Metro East and Southern Illinois because of their concerns about the fairness of the litigation climate. And for those who don't know, we're in uh, what, St. Clair County as we sit here? Saint, we're in St. Clair. My district has St. Clair and Madison County. Which uh, the so-called has been labeled, people disagree with this, but labeled a judicial hellhole. I, I never refer to it as, as hellholes, but the judges have to be, they, you can't go into this job shutting yourself off from the real world. If you do, you'll make the wrong decisions. But you also have to recognize, if people are concerned about the independence or the integrity of the judiciary, the judges have to do things to help assure people that our courts are the best, that they are the fairest, and that they're not subject to the whims of special interests. And uh, um, we've had the reputation for a while. I mean, we were the class action capital of the nation for a while. In terms of what, the number of cases? Uh, the number of cases, we were bringing in cases from all over the country. And uh, uh, my opponent had one where she sued Publishers Clearinghouse. Uh, she got a fee of $3, 000, or $3 million and many of the, her clients got checks for 12 cents. 12 cents. I mean, the stamp cost more to send it to them. Those are sort of things that people saw and they were concerned about. Why are we, and why are we getting these cases? Why are we getting, why are we having these national classes that are certified here? When I was on the appellate court, the Supreme Court reversed over $16 billion in class action judgments that came out of Southern Illinois. That's uh, you mean B, Illinois with a B, Supreme Court the Illinois Supreme, Supreme Court. Uh, where I was on the appellate court, uh, we had decertified or reversed uh, cases where hundreds of millions uh, were being sought in class action cases over very tenuous, over very tenuous things. You think, well, what are the damages here? Um, it looked like they were being done to help lawyers make a lot of money uh, and trying to rectify wrongs that people were kind of an afterthought. So I wanted to let you go because there's other aspects of this and you were addressing it. It's interesting to hear, but just to be clear, do you think relative to what, what we started on the question, uh, should you be running for office as a judge? Should we in Illinois have judges elected or do you think there's a better way? I like the, I like kind of a hybrid of the, the our system and the federal system. A merit selection of judges, uh, so they're put on the bench, uh, through a merit selection process, uh, but uh, that the voters ultimately get a chance to decide whether the judge should be on the bench uh, after a period of time. Circuit judges, it's six years. Uh, appellate Supreme Court judges now, retention is a little longer. But I think after a period of years, giving the voters the chance to say, I think this person is doing a good job as a judge, or I think this person is not doing a good job as a judge. You know, they're soft on crime, or they appear to be biased, or uh, there's something else that we're concerned about, that the person, maybe their, their temperament is such that they're rude to people and we don't think they're being fair. Uh, but the system that we have is you run uh, with a, a political affiliation and a general election, and, uh, and uh, that's the system we're at. So I don't have a problem working, working uh, through the system as we have it, but I, I, do, I am concerned about the, the special interests that uh, try to get involved in races and fundraisers. And then, and I, I want to make sure we get a little bit of your, your background and experience. Sure. Put that on the record. But relative to, we were talking also about uh, when you're out and talking to the voters, 
and you said it's hard. To, they might say, ask you a question you can't answer, but are, are there, as best as you can say, what, what's on the mind of the voters down in this part of Illinois uh, when you're out running? I think voters are concerned about, they're concerned about jobs. And they're concerned about the fact that um, are the courts, if, we're, if the courts are out of balance, is it costing us job opportunities? Uh, are our doctors, you know, are we going to go through another round where our doctors leave because they're concerned about uh, the independence of our judiciary, the fairness of our judiciary? I do think that, you know, the kind of questions you get that you can't answer. People will come to you and, and talk about their divorce case or I have my child custody case pending, and what about this, or what about that? Those are the kind of questions you can't, you can't answer. And there's probably a lot of people, I mean, the, you get a lot of people that, right. You do as a judge, and they're asking questions, yeah. if you're a What's the scar worth, judge? <laughs> On me, it wouldn't be worth much. Uh, but you get questions like that. But uh, I don't mind talking about judicial philosophy. One of the things I like about the fact that we have judicial elections in Illinois is it does give judges the opportunity to help educate people about the system, give them more information, uh, and I enjoy doing that. The other problem though with running an election, uh, you may, as a, see as a judge, your duties are to upheld the constitutional rights of everybody. You might have a case where law enforcement has made a serious error in the prosecution of a horrible crime. And your duty as a judge may be to say, you know what, uh, because of that, the person uh, doesn't get uh, as serious a penalty as he should get, or maybe the case has to be dismissed. You're accused of being soft on crime uh, in, a, in a persuasive 30 second ad that would take you 10 minutes to respond to, but you don't get that. So there's, there's those sort of things that happen in the judiciary. Uh, I don't mind, I've been, I've been fighting uh, for 25 years. But I think that it would be naive to think that there aren't some judges that if they were coming up right on an election might be concerned uh, how this case might look to a voter or the voting public. Uh, you don't want that, you want the judges to do their job, which is to, to uphold the rule of law and protect everybody, protect everybody's rights. Let, let's get uh, your background on the record. We already mentioned you, you at the moment, you're a circuit court judge, you're an, obviously an attorney. Uh, give us a bit of your resume and some of the background and how that may or may not uh, make you qualified to serve. Well, we're here at the McGlynn Law Office. I'm a fourth generation lawyer. Uh, my great grandfather started practicing law in this area in 1986, had the great uh, privilege to practice law with my father, uh, Bob McGlynn, my uncle Jim McGlynn, my uncle Joe McGlynn, practice with my brother Michael, practice with my cousin Maureen McGlynn. We have a very proud tradition. Uh, I have served, as I say, as an appellate judge. When I was an appellate judge, I authored over 100 decisions, and I was involved in hundreds of cases, criminal cases, civil cases, cases where uh, you know, somebody's constitutional rights were at stake, cases where hundreds of millions of dollars uh, potentially were at stake. Uh, as a trial judge, I've handled the, uh, probably the largest foreclosure docket south of Cook and the Collars. So I see firsthand uh, how, um, you know, this foreclosure crisis is affecting people in our community. I see how, what is really, what's kind of hamstringing us from, from you know, getting out of, uh, uh, out of this rut that we're in, uh, but I also see how devastating it is for families going through it uh, and how the judges can play uh, an important role. We can't change the law, but we can help people understand the process better. We can help them understand what their options are, uh, and we can encourage uh, the banks to try to work with the litigants to see if they can't save their home. Is that the gray area of the law? Let's say it's, I often say about legislation or, or governance, it's not an on-off switch, yes, no, yes, no, it's more of a reestat. It's how much do we want to have regulation, not yes or no on uh, Well, that's, that's true. There's you, may, that. you may get the prior parties together and say, uh, rather than me ruling right now, I want you to go back and see if you can work out a deal. I guess you could say that. Is you that can, the great you can, you, Well, the 
there's a couple things. The um, you can always, as a judge, encourage parties to try to resolve their differences in in a uh, in a reasonable way. And if you can do that, you know, sometimes you know people come to court, uh, they just have to tell their side of the story to an independent juror. And there's a lot of times it's just through the process of being heard and listening to and and having the judge ask the lawyers questions. Uh, the parties have a better sense of what the dispute is and frankly what under the law, what factors under the law are likely to be weighed heavier than others in resolving it. And so there's a lot you can do as a trial judge to try to help the parties get to an amicable resolution short of going to trial. Uh, you don't give legal advice. Uh, I never pressure people. You have to try. You have to try to settle this case, or you can't. Uh, I'm not going to give you your day in court. Uh, you should try to, uh, you know, work something out. But, you know, a lot of times the lawyers come to you and say, Judge, you know, we we'd like the court's help. We'd like the court's insight on what might be, from your objective perspective, what might be reasonable. And you certainly can do that without violating any codes of ethics. In fact, good judges do that all the time. And your, uh, your, again, some of your background. We talked about you uh, having years of being uh, uh, an attorney and I did practice a, uh, I've, primarily civil law. Case. Primarily, but I've had felony jury trials. I've, I'm licensed to practice before the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, or admitted to practice before the U.S. Supreme Court uh, in Missouri and Illinois. One of the things I did as a lawyer is I tried to force myself to handle a lot of different cases. Because I was actually interested in a lot of different things. I saw the courtroom through the perspective of the injured person, or the widow, or the child, but also the small businessman, or the manufacturer of a product that was being sued. I have represented people who were accused um, that the state was trying to prosecute. I did a lot of civil rights work. Years ago, we had a particular contentious racial incident that happened. And I met with the president of the NAACP, Johnny Scott. We've been friends for a long time. And I told him that uh, one thing we didn't want to do is we didn't want to politicize civil rights uh, because it's, it's easy to do. We don't want people demagoguing on civil rights issues. We want authentic civil rights violations being properly handled, properly championed. And that began, for me, a course of handling over a number of years, very important civil rights cases. Uh, I represented a group of, of African Americans that were being discriminated against their place of employment. And uh, I was very proud uh, to serve them and to help them uh, vindicate their rights. So, you know, I think from a judge's perspective, when you, as a lawyer, you've had that very broad background, it helps you when you're sitting there. You aren't, you know, I don't, I don't come to court rooting for a particular side. I come to court wanting to try to be fair to everybody and, and comfortable listening to people from whatever perspective, from whatever uh, background they're coming from. Let me, uh, just before time runs out, uh, John Thies, who's the current uh, president of the Illinois Bar Association, mm -hmm. one of the issues that he wants to lay on the table for discussion uh, during his presidency is uh, the recusal. When should a judge recuse themselves? Uh, you err on the side of caution. I was going to say, you had mentioned you're a Catholic, and that's fine. There's many, many Catholics. Uh, everyone's going to be something. Um, when do you, how do you, on one hand, you have the experience that you say adds to your understanding of life so that the law isn't merely theoretical. Right. On the other hand, we might have, as we were talking about Obamacare, and some have said that uh, it, the Obama uh, legislation is an attack against the Catholic Church and forcing hospitals that are run by Catholics to have uh, do abortions and things that are opposed to it. So, so where, at what point, or how do you apply something as personal as religion and then divorce yourself from your own feelings and apply the law, or, or do you? Uh, That's an excellent question, and it's, it's, there's really two aspects to it. The, the rules, uh, the Supreme Court rules, have some automatic, um, some automatic disqualifiers. I'm not going to hear any case that McGlynn McGlynn is a party to, or a relative is a party to, or 
Today I recused myself uh, from a case because I saw uh, the, uh, the defendant come in and it was somebody that we had done uh, some legal work for a few years ago. My, and, and then as a trial judge, every party gets an automatic um, change of judge for whatever reason. Don't like him, I think he might be too conservative, she might be too liberal, we're gonna take a change from this judge. You don't have that at the appellate court or Supreme Court level, but the reason is, is because you make decisions as a group. So the dynamics are a little bit different. Um, what are you, a three, three member? It's a three member panel. So for instance, running for office. I set up, I set up a firewall. I don't know who's giving money to me. I don't know what the amount of contributions are that are made to me. I don't know what, what my campaign account has as we sit here. Uh, I don't ask for money. I can't ask for money, but I'm, I'm happy with that, that sort of di dichotomy. Who asks us if someone else who's a finance person? You set up a finance committee and, money and, money right, and you know, don't tell me. I don't need to know. The other thing is, um, but I've had cases before where if I thought for, because of these particular set of facts, I can't be, I can't be the 100% fair that I want to be, I recuse myself. And, uh, you know, it's, there might be something about the facts that might reach a little bit too close to home. I mean, you could have a judge who just lost his wife and here comes a case where it's a wrongful death case and it's a husband suing because he lost his wife. You know, if that were me, I would probably say, you know, there are other very good judges in this courthouse. This might hit a little bit too close to home. I'm gonna let them handle that and I'll take another case. So I, I look, I think it's, it, it gets back to what I was saying earlier. People have to have confidence in the judiciary, particularly at times like this where we're going through tough times. We're always gonna be going through tough times. You want people on the bench that people are confident they're gonna be fair and that when the, when the judges hand down a ruling and they say, this is it, this, this controversy is resolved, people think, all right, the judges have spoke, they're fair, they know what the law is, they've applied it, and we're just gonna live with the, with the results. So uh, I'd be happy to uh, work with them on recusal standards. All right, well, Judge Stephen Glenn, we appreciate you taking the time. As we said earlier Thanks on- Thanks for having uh, me. It's always tough for voters to, I think, sometimes select the judicial candidates, but uh, hopefully we've given them something to- uh, Hopefully we give them something to swing at. I'm sorry? Hopefully we gave him something to swing at in this. <laughs> thanks. Thanks, thanks, for, uh, thanks for having me back. We appreciate it. You're watching the Illinois Channel, an independent nonprofit corporation formed to provide gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage of Illinois state government and other public affairs events taking place across Illinois.